the CV just touching me and I'm like, oh. Okay. <laughs> So welcome to the Liminal Gallery uh, Q&A series, the third and final one of the series. Um, we're obviously here in the exhibition, I took my power out of my hand. Um, four person show, including Henrietta Armstrong, who did this piece here behind me, and the sculptural pieces down here. We've also got a print edition by her as well. So, um, so I'm just gonna launch straight into the questions. Okay. Great, so um, your work seems to comment on the relationship humankind has with the natural world, um, the relationship that we have with each other, the fractitious tension between them. Do you agree and what do you hope to communicate with the viewer? Um, yeah, I think very much a lot of my work is about, I think, you know, it's a lot about humans and the human condition and what we're doing, what the hell we're doing, sort of on this earth. Um, I think especially through I look at a lot of objects and things that are that, that we make um, and I guess through my work I want people to just think and relate to that and just think what are we doing and why do we apply meaning to certain objects and I guess it, it's kind of spiritual in a way sometimes you know I think some objects are really important to people and I'm really interested in that and in particular sort of um, objects, you know, looking back into like music, people if they'd have like chalk poles and things like that, and they'd leave, leave tokens and things. And I think it's all that kind of just about being human, I guess, and what, what it is and why, and why we're here, you mm. know, which is quite a, you know, a big topic to tackle, but I'm doing it my own way, mm. I guess. Um, so you've previously put Medusa and your pylons um, and other creations onto masks and t-shirts. Why did you use that medium? Um, well, I, um, I really want, I like the idea about accessible art and I want art to be accessible for everybody. I think that it shouldn't, you shouldn't have to pay lots of money to go and see it or to own a piece of work and I really like that idea I and mean, I really love Keith Haring and you know, his idea about making are accessible to all of them. I think, you know, you've got the gallery, you've got traditional ways of having art, but then I think also we, clothing, things like that, you know, it's, it's accessible. It's, um, you know, everybody can have a piece of it, really. Mm -hmm. And so also, I think it's a little nod to kind of the, you know, eight-year-old me to make my own stickers, to make my own t-shirts, and I think, you know, eight-year-old me would probably think I'd made it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that you've got on a inner child. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's also just to make it fun. I think art oh, should be fun. You know, I think it's too serious sometimes. And I think that, um, yeah, this, you know, I think a lot of people find the art really alienating. Maybe they don't feel that they, you know, they might feel a bit strange going in the gallery. And I think that art is for everybody, whether it's something that you love that's on a, you know, a biscuit tin or whether it's, you know, I think art is very personal and everybody's idea of art is, uh, you know, art can be, it is really personal to the viewer, so, mm. And um, so your work ranges in scale, uh, from the huge dollar uh, sculpture that you've currently got at the National Sculpture Prize, and um, to postcard size works. Are your works site specific or do you um, intentionally play with scale? I think, Really, it just um, depends on what I'm working on. I think that just kind of fits with the, not with the brief, but you know what I mean? I think it just depends. I mean, when the idea comes in my head, you know, I don't intentionally get think. I mean, I think last year, my motto at the beginning of the year was like, go big or go home, you know? And I was sort of like, then it got so big, and I was like, oh my God, this is just too big, you know? But I don't think I intentionally go, you know, but I think it really depends on what the, you know, what, the, what I'm dealing with and whether I go big or small, but you know, I think it just fits with whatever project I'm doing. Mm, yeah, I think the dollar is like a good um, example of like your playing with scale because the one that you have, the sculpture prize is just ginormous, isn't it? They're like, they're sea defences and they're these really odd shapes. They almost look like a kid's game, like they're, they're yeah, funny like little, yeah. yeah. 
and um, and you've got like absolutely huge ones. And as I saw the installation that you did at um, the Thames side, where they had lots of very little ones, yeah. and it's just interesting, like really playing with that scale of them. Well, I think I like, started with the smaller ones, and then the National Sculpture Prize was the scaling up of that project. Right. But obviously, the real ones are. I mean, it's kind of my interpretation of the real ones, but the. But, you know, they're about 80, you know, they're about 80 tons, so they're quite huge and you can walk on them. But I just, um, I think, it's quite a weird thing because they're almost like modular, you know, I like the idea of playing scale because I've worked with projects where you're looking at, I think, especially the big sculpture you're dealing with weight. And I think at a certain point you're in your studio and you think, well, you, you know, I've had previous projects where I had to hire, a, well, I, I bought a, um, an engine crane to be able to move things around because I didn't want to away. <laughs> so I think it's very much, I like the idea about the, the dolos and the sea defences because they're interlocking that it's also modular, so it's kind of like a modular work, you know, so you can make it big and heavy, but many pieces make a bigger, massive thing. So I think it's, it's just about trying to work with scale and weight and making it manageable when you're, it's just you and your studio working alone. And I mean, I think after the Dollars project, I was definitely like, I had, I had muscles. <laughs> <laughs> I think each one weighed about 30 kilos and I was casting it later. You know, and I found this weird way of like, just carrying them around without sort of breaking my back. But I think it is, you know, working with weight and scale, it's always kind of, it's quite scary, because you're mm. thinking like, how am I going to lift that, I think. But, yeah, you know, I think there's a way around it, so it's just me trying to work my way around making bigger things. And do you consider, like, how you're going to move them around before you make them, or do you make them and then you think, what are they doing? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, there's, there's a project I'm working on at the moment, and I think there are different things, and you do suddenly think, oh, um, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying, like, you know, because, you know, yeah, I think you're lifting, you know, or, or something might be, you know, at least sort of um, 200 kilos, and you're like, well, you know, my, my brother's a, a sort of weightlifter, so I'm going to get him to bring a couple of friends around and just <laughs> lift it somehow, and you're like, mm, maybe that's not very good for health and safety. But, you know, it's just, <laughs> Yeah, there's no such thing in our studios, is there? <laughs> 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 yes, but I think it's one of those things where, yeah, I think I do sort of come up with the idea and then work out how to do it after, mm. and then it's, yeah, then it's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so your axe handle sculptures, these pieces here, uh, sticks and stones may break my bones, are masculine, yet the re repetition of them makes them kind of softer, somehow morphing into bone-like structures, so instead of the thing that's meant to break the bones, they always become the bones themselves. Um, do you want to tell me a bit more about the about work? Yes, I think it's, I came up with this idea, I think I was, I was late one night and I was in the top of a bus and I was sort of like, oh, it just had to popped into my head, but it's quite a personal work and I don't really do personal, well, I haven't really done personal work in the past, um, but this is, um, my father died when I was quite young, and uh, he had this axe handle which he used to keep under his bed, and it was quite, um, yeah, I don't know, there's a charm that used to just play with this piece of wood, and it was a piece of oak, um, and I just used to, I don't know, I just liked it, I don't know, as a child, you just like things, I don't know why, and I was sort of, I didn't really see the connotation of it being quite a, a, a violent, or potentially violent object, or, um, but, but he used to keep under his bed when he was out in the country and he used to keep under his bed for protection and um, somehow I acquired it, I don't know, and I didn't really know what to do with it, so I was just like, I keep it under my bed, which <laughs> it just seemed like the place, you know, where it should go, but I just thought about, you know, I'm very into casting and making multiples of things at the moment, and I just thought about, you know, it's interesting thinking about when you when you make a cast and you multiply something, does it lessen the meaning or does it strengthen the meaning? You know, does it multiply the meaning? Does it make it 12 times more precious or does it make it less? Or you know, So I'm quite interested in that, but also, I don't know, it's quite a, it's quite a strange object, I guess, I mean, but I just felt by making it in plaster, making it kind of quite delicate as well, you know, it can easily, it's very, very easy breakable. Um, I just thought, it, 
Yeah, it's almost, I think it's quite a charged piece. I think, you know, it's almost like the sticks are there, you know, for people that, you know, they could have just been going out to sort of beat somebody or not. It's just, yeah. Um, it's quite weird because it's, you know, dealing with that kind of thing. And I was just thinking it kind of opens, you know, I don't know whether it kind of opens up different meanings and emotions because I don't have many objects from my farm and it's just very precious. Um, yeah. I think it's interesting as well that you've chosen to show some that are actually broken. Yeah. Um, so there's like this little piece over here. Um, you know, so so you can see like the how fragile it is, even though it's obviously taken from this chunk of wood. I mean, it must be really heavy, but these are you know really easily breakable. Yeah. Um, there's just like a really interesting kind of um, connotations with that. I think it just makes it a bit, I think the idea of it as well is just to think about objects and also these through objects, these relationships that we have with people and how tenuous and fragile they are, I think, you know, because, you know, it's easily broken. Well, these are easily broken, but also like, you know, somebody's there and then they're not, you know, or, you know, it just makes, I wanted people to think more about the fragility of, you know, relationships and who you know, people that we have in our lives and just maybe sort of hold them a bit more carefully, mm. I guess. Yeah. Um, so why did you choose to highlight Eve in your installation, mm. piece of me, and the Risograph edition? Um, so when I was looking at, um, so I was looking, because it was part of um, Power of Women Festival as well, I mean, I look a lot at different mythologies and histories and I think I was, I didn't initially intend to do something on Eve, um, but then I think it's, she's relatable to, you know, most people, she's supposed to be the first woman, uh, apart, woman apart from Lilith, uh, you know, doing something in the, um, Judaism, was potentially supposed to be, you know, the first woman who, um, you know, Adam's first wife who didn't obey him, so she was banished and then, you know, but Eve was his wife, but on reading it, which is really interesting because I was looking at it and I think the idea of Eve has been around way before, like, like thousands of years before Christianity, and she was a really, really powerful deity, and, you know, so she was much, I think women were much sort of held on a higher, you know, you know much more worship than we are today. Um, because we have the power of creation and she, um, apparently Adam came from her, so she existed before Adam in these early mythologies and it was sort of a patriarchal society in the Christian church that sort of came and they edited everything, so they made, they switched everything around so that, you know, Eve just came from Adam's rib, but it was, it was originally the other way. Um, so I just found that really interesting that you know, she was all powerful, but then suddenly now she was just put aside and this little woman and basically the fall of man was blamed on her. So it's like Yapal was just a, you know, a Christian construct. It was just, mm -hmm. and it just made me really angry, actually. Just there's so many things about people and women getting written out of history and not being remembered. And it's just quite shocking. I think it's just, there are a lot of people looking at different things like that and just you women know, that have just been have invented things and made some out of history that we don't know and just, you know, so if it's like Mary Annie who discovered all the, the fossils and everything and then people would just, you know, they actually buy them off from them and just like, well, you know, just write their names if they discovered it and it's just, so, um, it's just, you know, it's just mind-blowing how often it's happened and I think it's just, yeah. They do a really good job of covering it all up as well, don't they? You know, yeah, I had no idea that he was, very, yeah. you know, such an amazing deity. Yeah. But I think it's just, everywhere, it's just so interesting, but I was just like, you know, this is... So I just, you know, wanted to kind of honour her in a way, you know, and, you know, being the, you know, the original woman, mm. supposedly. And what about all of the arms? Well, mm. I think she didn't have any. Playing around, and then she just, yeah, she disappeared. But 
She didn't have any arms, of course, dear, so I just gave her a knee. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, how do you cre create your concepts for your work? Do you plan or do you work uh, serendipitously? Um, well, I think I probably work quite intuitively. Mm -hmm. it, intuitively, it, um, I, um, it depends on what the project, you know, on what, you know, what the project demands. But you know, I'm just, I generally, I'm just interested in everything. So I always want to be in, you know. Do everything as an artist. I think that there's so many different things that you know. It, it, I think as you get older, you're just like I haven't got much time. You know, there's so many different things that I want to do. But um, I think I just tend to see what the project is and then you know get really heavily involved in it, just because I want to learn and I want to learn more about whatever it is. So. Um, that's interesting that you talk about time because I've spoken to a lot of artists recently and they've all said the same thing. Like, I think that artists are hyper aware of how much time they have and how much time they have to create artwork. It's something that I have never thought about before, but just in the last couple of weeks I've spoken to so many people that have said the same thing. I think it is very much, you know, I think it, you notice as, as you get older anyway, you think, God, you think you've got so much time when you're younger and then you just don't. And then you're like, oh, well, suddenly you're like older, and you're like, how did that happen? Yeah. But I think as an artist, it's all about the work. You know, you 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 just you know. I think I think when I was thinking about these questions, I was thinking that it's quite interesting because a lot of work, you're not necessarily thinking about the viewer. You're not making it to be viewed. You're making it because it needs to exist. Yeah. It's not what you, you know, when you actually think about the viewer, that's maybe sometimes secondary, you know, you just, you just have this idea and you have to make that, but ultimately the amount of work or what the amount of works we can make is finite, so it's just, you know, yeah, unless you have like many systems, each one. Just get the concept person, but I think it is, it is worrying, you know, because you think, oh, this, yeah. Is, is quite a thing. Time definitely starts to add more pressure as we get older. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. Like an extra, an extra awareness and an extra pressure that kind of I've never really thought about before. Is well, I think really yeah, artists, artists are very so I think yeah. you know, most artists we work. You know, even if you've got when you've got, you know, most artists obviously have a part-time job to sustain themselves as well. Mm -hmm. But you know, you're usually doing a part-time job and then you're in the studio the rest of the time. You don't have weekends, it doesn't don't exist. But you, do, you don't feel like it's work necessarily, yeah. so you just want to be there anyway. So we like work seven days a week, pretty much. So. Mm -hmm. Work on it. Um, so, uh, kind of going back to what you were talking about earlier, actually, um, your work feels heavily research-based. Um, you delve headfirst into a wide ranging topics and then pull them apart and comment on them. Is that a, a really important like, aspect of your practice? Um, I think so. I mean, I like to, I think the whole aim of every project is to learn something and to mm. learn, to explore. And I think that's really important to be able to, you know, you give something, but also you take something, you know, from every project. Mm. And I think, um, yeah, I think, you know, I definitely want to learn. I think a lot of the, you know, when a lot of my work is process based with casting, with that, and generally I usually, like we were talking earlier, uh, you know, I might say, oh, I want to do this and not know how to do it, and it's probably, you know, sometimes quite a big thing, and then I'll learn how to do it, so it's the, the you know, learning the process as well, mm. but, you know, there's a lot of, you know, watching old men in sheds, you know, doing stuff on YouTube and learning how they've, you know, made that or how they've cast that or the, you know, so I think that is, you know, because I think um, usually when I finish a project it's kind of, a, I feel quite bereft because it's like, you know, it's not about making the piece, it, well it is about making the piece but it's not about the final piece, it's about the journey, it's about learning how to do that thing, being able to do that thing, it's usually, I enjoy that much more than having the final thing, I can just learn what's next, I need to do something else, so, mm. yeah. Yeah, it feels like you kind of, it doesn't feel like it's 
they go, um, you learn something, and then maybe that leads on to something else, because you've worked on the sea defences, you've done um, Medusa, and, um, and worked on, on pylons, and so like, it feels like you're, I don't know, searching, searching for something. I just really like the challenge. Yeah. I think, you know, because I think with the sculpture prize, like after, I remember, after I'd done it and they were in place, I was so underwhelmed because I put them there and then I was like, oh, that's it. I was just like, all that work. Yeah. And then they're just there. And, you know, I don't know that's sad. Obviously, you're like, oh, you know, but it's kind of like, oh, I did it, that's great. But then you're like, what's next? I need to do something else. Yeah. So, you know. so that they're kind of like, once they're out in the world, it's just like, you've given birth and then it's like, I see you, you're on to the next. Good for yourself. So it's kind of almost like yeah, they are a byproduct of the, mm. the kind of the journey, and, uh, which is what, yeah, not everything, but I think a lot of things. Yeah. Mm. Um, so that kind of leads me on quite nicely onto the next question: um, Who or what are your greatest influences? Oh, I struggle with it. I think it's really hard because I'm really not, I don't really think I'm that super frantic. I just mm. don't, you know, I have a few people, you know, like, you know, people, famous people that I love, but I'm just never been a massive kind of fan girl, you know, kind mm. of, that I really sort of um, has a massive influence on me. But it's strange because I, sometimes I don't listen to music for ages. Mm. And then I listen to music again and I'm like, why do you not listen to music more? Because it's like, I really find it has a powerful effect on me. Um, mm. And people around me, I think I'm just very lucky to have so many lovely, wonderful people in my life mm. um, that are supportive, that I admire, that, that you know, are in my, in my circle, you know, mm. so it's just, and I love meeting people, you know, and I'm really lucky to meet so many nice people, so, yeah. but um, keep hair, I'd say, and then um, ask <laughs> um, and for Francis Bacon, I love Francis. Mm. But, but yeah, I mean, and I find them, it's weird, like you go to an exhibition and but it won't necessarily be directly, you know, it won't directly be influenced, but it will kind of, you know, inspire in certain ways. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So my last little question is, do you have any exhibitions or projects coming up? Um, well, I've just... Um, I've got another exhibition coming up with Bessons in a, a big tithe barn in Wiltshire um, and I'm remaking the um, Dolos, the National Sculpture Prize um, piece because that's been outside and this is going to be an in inside piece so um, yeah, I must think I'm a bit crazy to remake it because it nearly killed me but I think I'm doing it again. <laughs> working with different materials, you know, how does, how does that differ from cedar to working with, you know, concrete or something like that? Um, I think it kind of fits, I mean, at the moment, because I think I've got this kind of work, you know, with Eve and with Medusa and, because um, I used to do a lot of graffiti when I was younger, I used to do a I used to be a specialist, mm -hmm. so I kind of went away from that and I was a portrait painter and then I, felt like I was painting myself into a hole and then I think it's weird the artistic journey how we don't you know how we allow ourselves to do stuff we think that we can't do stuff so I had to go through all these different weird kind of journeys to allow myself and say well, no it's okay for you to do sculpture you can do sculpture you can do ceramics if you want to do it if you so I don't know I really think I just want to do everything it's really difficult mm -hmm. but um, but yeah, I think working, I think I've got quite a graphic mind, you know, with, so I think that works quite well and I think it feels like one outlet and then the sculptural side is, I've just always been, I've always made things, like, and I didn't actually 
connect that within my practice of quite, it was mainly two dimensional and then I started making things and I was like, well of course this makes sense, you always made things as a child, I was always just having this, you can't even explain it, like just how you know how to do something, you can, you just, it's very intuitive, you just like somehow that happens, so it just, mm. it's almost bringing two things together which yeah happened a few years ago, but I think it's just a different a different outlet. Mm. Does that make sense? Did I answer the question? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you think that does that relate to um, what he's talking about with time? Because you come from like say doing graffiti um, to portraits to so maybe that I don't know. Just thinking myself like, that might to do with, with artists and time to to find your like to be like okay, this is what I'm kind of owning this or this is where I feel most comfortable, or this is what's getting my point across the most. And I think maybe that might, I don't know if that has a thing to do with why well, I think time is precious, because we've not, a lot of artists might not have found that they've found the bit that expresses what they need to say, because it does change as well, doesn't it? Because you change with time as well, so I don't know whether. Yeah, I think, I think it is, and I think it's, yeah, I think we change, you know, like we have at least seven different people in our lives we, as we get older. I think, but we change what we want to work with at different times, I think, and what fits, I guess. You know, I think there are a lot of people that almost are sort of painting themselves into a, a hole or whatever because I think they, you know, they've started doing this thing and then you're sort of like, well, how did they get out of that? Because mm -hmm. they're just, they're doing the same thing over and over again, but then changing it slightly by doing a pink edition or, and I, you know, I find that too restrictive. I wouldn't be able to do that, you know. Because then you'd be like, well, you couldn't suddenly go like, hey, I'm doing this now, you know. It's, yeah. yeah. You have to met with a lot of backlash if you do suddenly change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's difficult because once it becomes a brand and it becomes yeah, yeah. successful, it's difficult to then turn yeah, it down and be like, no, I'm not doing it. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a really difficult situation that a lot of artists find themselves in. I admire people, you know, it also it's very admirable because, you know, that they found their thing and they yeah. found their thing that works and they're happy, you know, doing that, so it's, yeah. It's funny because the artists that inspire you kind of, to me, are doing it, have done that. Yeah, yeah. So, Basquiat, yeah. Pete Cameron and um, Francis Bacon, they're all people who say they don't do that, but they're actually yeah. the ones that kind of did brand themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's quite interesting that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think branding is my wife, I just think it's like literal, a literal repetition of certain things over and over is yeah. it's quite restrictive. Mm -hmm. You know, I think in this day and age you have to brand yourself really in a way. You know, oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I do yeah. agree. Yeah, somehow. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Um, so, while you were talking, I've not got questions, but I just, you know, you want to comment, and I can't remember that. Was everything is like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but then you know, it's really interesting, and it's, it's funny that you, you might um, have different ways of doing it and different mediums and stuff, but it, there must be like maybe a common thread. And I don't know, while you were talking and like, looking at the um, piece on the wall and the talk about the, um, the back and dad's sticks and stuff, and, I don't know, for me it felt like there was a, a theme of like protection and, and weight um, and that was just kind of what was going through my mind when he was talking, like sometimes the common thread, I don't know whether it is, but it just felt like that was a part for me from him. Yeah, no, I think it does, that does make sense because even like now you're saying that because it makes me think the dolls are about protecting the, the sea, you know, the, the land from the sea and the knees are about, mm -hmm. but I think a lot of my stuff is yeah, it's difficult. I say spiritual, but it's kind of like karmic, I think. You know, I want it to be, it comes from here, you know what I mean? It comes from a, a place that, fit, you know, it's just when you're thinking of an idea and it just kind of like, it's almost like hair bears and it kind of just beams out of you that energy. Um, and it's great around to kind of, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you want the people to, yeah, you want people to feel that as well. It's about dealing with difficult things, but just, you know, wanting everybody to feel good, I guess, you know, you know, and just be human, you know, we're all, just connect and be human, mm -hmm. and be kind to each other, really. 
you know. But I think it's, I think my work's coming together. I think this because it's, yeah, I've always really liked black and white imagery. My dad had a photocopier, so I just go mad on that. <laughs> when I was a child, and I always had these black and white mood boards on my kind of my wall, and it's kind of that somehow filtered into my work. So I think it is gradually coming together. The more it's like just you know the older you get, and sort of the older you get, you keep on realizing you're making the same mistakes mm -hmm. or whatever again. You know, but in artwork, you can see you can start to see the patterns kind of come together. Mm -hmm. yeah. Have you seen the um, Wings of Desire? Um, Wim Wenders, so he does a lot of black and white um, in that photo. It's beautiful. I just think from yeah, what he's talking about, maybe he'd really like it. It's, it's set from <clears throat> the idea is like almost spirits like looking down on the earth and it's all in black and white and they like, quickly shoot to colour every so often, but it's set in Berlin, it's really beautiful. Oh, with wings of Desire. With Wings of Desire. Oh, so oh, yeah. yeah, Wim Wenders, so the, the photographer, he directs. He kind of made the direct, yeah. Oh, really look for that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll definitely look for that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. That's okay.